carefully crafted and debated over the last few years. First, last few months, I should say. Mr. Ashraf has led the effort from the Ministry of Commerce. He uh, comes with very strong credentials. There is a uh, well-versed <coughs> Ministry of Commerce man and has worked very hard on the tariff thing and he's conducted a widespread consultation. He's regarded as one of the best people in the Ministry of Finance. Ministry of Commerce, sorry. And now he's going off to Sydney to help increase our export from there as a commercial officer. So, welcome Mr. Ashraf. That's absolutely wonderful. Um, and we really look forward to learning about the tariff policy. And PID is, as you know, a major think tank. PID must keep track of all these things and try and understand it. For those of you who don't know PID, the history of the PID is long. It's probably the first think tank in the developing world. It was started in 1954 or 55. And uh, contributed a lot to the debate in Pakistan. Most important example is the 22 families which came out of the PID. Then after that, the regional disparities came out of the PID. Then the privatization and trade liberalization debat a debate started here, thanks to Mr. Kamal. 22 families was Mahbub al -Haq, and uh, the, the regional disparities was people like Anisa Rahman and uh, who are the others, I forget now, but uh, many people like that. and then. Along came the issues of, um, uh, you know, for example, cities and urban development and uh, um, domestic commerce, etc. So we had a long history of doing this. Our point is really to get into government policy and be the leading think tank in, in, in public policy. We want to be, as I said, the nest pack of public policy. So we're trying to engage with all ministries, all donors, etc., to try and see what we can learn about public policy and hold forums like this to understand so we've got Mr. Ashraf to help us, but along with Mr. Ashraf, we've got Dr. Manzoor. I don't think Dr. Manzoor needs any introduction. When the name tariff comes in, or anything to do with trade policy, Dr. Manzoor is foremost. Everybody knows him. He writes in newspapers, recently wrote a lovely article on industrial policy. Enjoy it, Dr. Sam. It's a great article. And uh, he's always very clear, very uh, conceptual, so that will be lovely. Then we've got Madam Rubina from the National Tariff Commission. So I think we've got a complete panel here. She's also, uh, you know, being on the National Tariff Commission. Of course, she's in charge of everything to do with tariffs. And she has, uh, I'm obviously, the Tariff Commission has a lot of say in all these things. So I think we've got a very interesting panel. So I'm looking forward to it. So let me first begin by calling Mr. Ashraf to explain the National Tariff Policy. Ah, yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Uh, I will just say a couple of sentences on thanking Pride and Dr. Sub for taking the initiative. Rather, I would uh, use the word jumping on this, that as soon as it was announced, Dr. Sub called uh, Secretary Commerce 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, that we want to, to uh, have a session on this, and then it all started at 7 o'clock, Dr. Sub and myself were on. on of phone line with each other and we, we planned this session. Thank you, Dr. Sir, for, for this um, excellent initiative. I will just take a few minutes. It's a substantive 10, 11 slides presentation is there just to give you uh, a little overview of what this policy is and where we came from when we were uh, formulating this policy. This will be the, the sequence. Why did we, uh, why do we need a national tariff policy and then uh, a few slides on its uh, salient features or the basic conduits. Why tariff policy? This is where it, it comes from. We think that in, if you look at this export equation, uh, all the major uh, countries whom would we would like or even dislike but still have to compare ourselves with are on this slide. This is their market share since 2003. Bangladesh has increased its market share by more than 160 uh, percent, China more than 120 percent, India 111 percent, SARC 88 percent, even Africa has increased by 33 percent, Asia overall 33 percent, ASEAN 23 percent, Pakistan has decreased its share by 23 percent during all this period. 
So we are basically, this, this is the realization in Ministry of Commerce that we are uh, a very sad and unfortunate outlier in this, this century which is called the Asian growth century. The, the global epicenter of growth has located in the region where we find ourselves in. So two of the, the, the fastest growing economies of Asia are on our borders, but that, it means that there is nothing wrong with the region, there is something wrong with us, that we are not growing. So we try to, to find the correlations between different things. One of the biggest correlations or the variable in, in this uh, poor performance of our exports is there is a linkage between how our exports and, and tariffs have been, been rising and falling. There is an inverse relationship. In 2000, our average weighted average growth tariff, uh, sorry, weighted average tariff was 23%. Our exports were 8.6 billion US dollars. We reduced our tariffs by 2015 to 8.9%. Our exports went up to 25%, uh, 25 billion. We reversed the equation during the last four years, and here is where our exports are. That our tariffs have increased to 12.7%. Our exports have gone down. Earlier, going down to. 20.4 billion and then recovering a little bit during the last couple of years to 23.2 billion. When we compare our tariffs with, with other countries, this is how the comparison is. USA 1.7%, ASEAN 2.5%, the global average is 2.6%. The top 70 exporting nations, these are those 70 nations who have exports of more than 20 billion. So, all these nations who have exports of more than 20 billion, their average tariff is 2.7%. It means there must be something common between the tariffs, the low tariffs and, and, and the high export growth as well. As you, you move up the ladder, your tariffs go down. China is 3.8%, India is 5.8%, South Asian average is 5.9%. We have the average only customs tariff is 12.7%. This is another uh, slide on data that we have, how much we have been relying for collection of revenues on, on uh, the tariffs at the import stage. While all these nations, the developing economies, the highest one whom we, we compare ourselves with it is India. India uh, relies only 13% for its total uh, revenues at the import stage. We collect more than 48%, now it has gone nearly 50% of our entire tariffs are from uh, uh, at the import stage. The major reason is because this is an easy buck which we have been making as a nation because it's easy to collect the, t the, the revenues at the import stage. You don't really need to lift a finger to collect these. You only need to issue a, a, a notification increasing the rate from 10% to 5% and next to 15% to and next day the importer will deposit that money in your account and only then uh, come up for the clearance of his container. You are absolutely doing nothing to collect those revenues. So this is an easy way out. Whenever you are failing to collect the revenues, this is the easiest way to do. And this is what we did during the last IMF program as well. That when we were uh, uh, taking the pride that we have doubled our, our revenue collection during the last IMF program. What actually went up was only the tariffs at the import stage. There was hardly any collection of the direct taxes that, during that, that. And that is what happened. That it, it, it led to your industrial stagnation and, and the lowering of exports. This is what we did to our, our, our raw materials. That raw material tariffs from 2004 to 2008, we brought it down from 7.4% to 2.3%. It came down to 1%, remained stable for the next 4-5 years till 2013 at 1.3% and we started jacking, that cut, jacking it up again. And now, only on the, 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 uh, the raw materials, we are collecting 6%. It has increased from 1.3% to 6%. How we, we think these high tariffs are impact in, impacting our, uh, our industrialization and, and exports. It is creating anti-export bias. I am talking to a very informed audience 
I will need to teach how the, the tariffs create an, an anti-export bias. That it makes the domestic market more luc lucrative than, than exports. There is lack of in integration into global value chains because of high tariffs. We have created an industry which is unable to compete in the domestic market, not to speak of uh, competing in the global market. Most of our import substitution industry is uncompetitive in the global market. This is where our problem comes from. Out of the $55 billion worth of imports last year, only $2 billion imports went into your exporter-ended production. $53 billion have been directly or indirectly consumed in this country. And this import substitution industry, which hates to be, be become competitive in the global market, it has created a paradigm for itself. The paradigm is to go for protection rather than competitiveness. When sitting as the Director General Trade Policy Director in, in the Ministry of Commerce, hum to taras gaye thi is baat se. Some day an industrialist comes to us and tells us that increase my competitiveness. Everybody comes and asks, give me more protection. This is the paradigm in which the industry is developing itself. So we need to really rethink this, that if the tariffs go high, what, what are we doing with our... This is probably, in my view, as the, 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 the trade pra practitioner, the biggest reason probably of our episodic growth in this country. Because whenever your growth heats up, you are importing the, the raw materials, intermediate goods, and the final consumption goods, which ultimately end up in the domestic market. So, whatever raw material is being imported, at the end of the day, it's not translating into any additional earned dollars. So, whatever you are spending on, 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 on the raw materials, this industry remains the net importer rather than net exporter at any point of time. So, this is where, our, this is what the tariffs are, are uh, how they are playing with the economic structure of the country. There is a huge elite capture. I tell you from my personal experience, how the, 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 the policy is manipulated during the months of May and June, you really cannot find a, the, the hotel room in, these, the, in, in, in Islamabad in, in the five-star hotels. Because everybody throws to the Islamabad to, to, to manage, uh, the, to, to capture the policy uh, which is coming in, in, in the budget. So there is a huge elite capture in our tariff structure. Then, of course, it leads to the increase in smuggling only for the revenue component, our calculation, the research study uh, commissioned by the FBR showed that we had $10 billion worth of only the loss of revenue because of smuggling, because of we have, we have high uh, uh, tariffs which make an economic case for the, the, uh, the smuggling and the smuggling is leading in, in, in turn to, to nearly $10 billion worth of loss of revenues. And smuggling makes any policy in this country completely ineffective. All policies, your tariff barriers, your all tariff barriers go out of the window if the, the, the thing has been smuggled into the country. This is how, while we, we increased so many, uh, we had a huge jump of 28 notches in our, in our ease of doing business last year. Our global competitiveness has worsened rather than improved. This is what the, while I, uh, that's uh, my understanding on, on, on as, as we speak today was, I wrote in one of my articles as well, our export fundamentals are not very bad at the moment. Your currency is very competitively priced. Your energy rates are fairly good because you have insulated the industrial sector and especially the export sector from the hike in energy prices because we are giving them 7.5 5 cent to the industry. We are giving 6.5 cent on, on, on uh, gas as well, so they have been, been insulated from there. Our export refinance is at 3.5 percent, our long term finance facility is, is also at 3 to 3.5 percent and it goes a, a little higher but still we can keep it. So the basic fundamentals are there, there are only two issues and as a trade practitioner that I look at, there are two things, one is your tariff which is not letting you, you move forward. And the other one is your, your policy rate, which is, which is making the cost of capital more expensive. The rest of every is, uh, are, are the smaller variables. So one of these reasons is that the tariffs has led us to this competitiveness that we are not really 
translating our ease of doing business into to competitiveness. Though Gonzalo would, would hate to hear this, but this is how I believe. In this context, this is how we, we formulated the national tariff policy. This tariff policy uh, is probably one of the most debated documents in this country uh, between the institutions during the last one and a half year. The first draft of this policy was formulated in, in April 2018. We shared it with all the trade bodies of the country, including FPCCI, asked FPCCI to conduct seminars on it as well, and we uploaded it to the Ministry of Commerce website. It still is there for the last 18 months or so. Then we conducted a consultative seminar where we invited all the stakeholders in, in Islamabad. There we discussed it. We circulated it to all the ministries. Then the summary was presented to the cabinet. Then we the, the cabinet referred it back to have another round of consultations. We did it another round of consultations. And finally, it has been approved by the prime minister and then by, by the cabinet. So this is uh, uh, quite a well-debated policy. It was... was, was it has uh, all, all the, the comments of many stakeholders have, have really been, been incorporated in it. The last three slides, what is the policy? Where it was coming from and the, these are the salient features of the policy. The objective of the policy is to improve competitiveness. Competitiveness remains at the core of the policy. Increase employment opportunities through investment, improve consumer welfare, and remove tariff anomalies. These are the four basic objectives of of from uh, 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 which this policy flows out, the principles which have been set down are to treat tariffs as a trade policy instrument and an instrument of industrialization rather than a revenue instrument. Simplify tariffs by reducing exemptions and concessions. The tariff structure sh should remain cascading. The infant industry should be given protection, the reasonable level of protection, whenever uh, to, to a reasonable level I will come to it later on. Competitive import substitution. The phrase, the key phrase here is, this country needs only that import substitution which is competitive, not the uncompetitive import substitution, because that is the net guzzler of foreign exchange which this country cannot afford. We don't have really the dollars to feed that uncompetitive industry to keep on importing the raw materials and, and uh, pumping it into the domestic market. The policy recommendations. We started this policy with some of the very granular kind of recommendations where we put in some of the numbers there. The tariffs should go from number X to number Y and, and so on. But with the, the, the passage of time, with the input from stakeholders, that's how we, we converted it into the basic principles rather than putting in the numbers. Because we thought that putting in the numbers is more of a professional's job that Madam will be, be, be uh, covering in, in today's panel. That how, whenever we are putting the numbers, it should look at the whole picture, not only the, that we should, we should not be, be really jumping the gun on these. The policy recommendations will be implemented during five years. Tariff slabs will be simplified based on the principle of cascading. Tariffs on raw materials, intermediate goods and capital goods will be gradually reduced. All of these are the principles of the policy on which Madam and her team will be working during the, the coming months and years. Additional custom duty and regulatory duties will be gradually reduced. The difference in tariff for commercial and industrial importer of raw materials, intermediate goods and capital goods will be eliminated. Nascent industry will be provided. The word, key word here is time bound. There will not be an unlimited protection available to any industry anymore. It will be a time bound protection. We can negotiate the time limit. It can be two years, five years, ten years, but not thousand years. We have to, 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 to agree on, on a reasonable time limit and then, then go ahead. This is the institution. This was probably the most uh, uh, resisted one, uh, the, the, the part of the, the tariff policy which delayed its implementation for quite some time and this is the last slide of the presentation. That what will be the institutional framework for tariff setting? So far, the, the tariff setting was being done by FBR as 
FDR's main goal is the revenue collection and whenever they get the target, it's the easy parking. Whenever Madam Teresa was this time negotiating the, the, the program with, with FDR and there were the revenue targets, the easiest, uh, the, the, the recipe they presented to the IMF program without consulting anyone including the industry or the Ministry of Commerce was that we will increase the tariffs and get X billion dollars for, uh, rupees from, from the tariffs. So we tried uh, to convince the government that this needs to be located outside FDR. The tariff setting should go where it belongs to. And that is, we have to treat it as an instrument of industrialization and, and uh, trade. So it has to move to the Ministry of Industries and, and, and Commerce. This is the tariff policy board which will be headed. It's very interesting. It will be headed by the Commerce Minister. Coincidentally, as we speak, we have the same uh, Minister for Industries and Commerce, but it may not be the same tomorrow. We have said the second person there at the ministerial level is the Minister for Industries, not the Minister for Revenues. So there are two ministerial level presentations. This is speaks of the government's paradigm shift from revenue to industrialization and trade. And then we have all the stakeholders, those who have the stakes in revenues, finance, commerce, FBR, Board of Investment and NTC, they are on the policy board. And then for this, the secretariat was equally important for us because all the professional work has to be done at the secretariat level. We have created a National Tariff Policy Center. Already it has been created under, under Madam's leadership in the NTC. So this is what will be our institutional support being provided to the Tariff Policy Board. Thank you very much. Well, Assalamu alaikum and uh, uh, Dr. Saab, uh, I'm really grateful for this. I mean, I have been working on these tariff issues and customs for the last 30, 40 years, but this is the first time I ever see a debate on this. And although, I mean, if you, for Pakistan, and, and uh, that's what WTO, they, they do our uh, trade policy review every six years, and they say customs tariff is the most important, uh, is the main policy instrument of Pakistan. It could be something else. Well, you know, at one time we used to do, okay, we don't allow import and this is tied list and this, but now it's all through customs tariff. But it's such a harsh thing. I, I had um, prepared something and unfortunately couldn't uh, <laughs> interact with uh, Ashraf and, and he, he said what I would have said, but he said it in maybe much better way. So I'll perhaps uh, leave those things on his side. Just, uh, but there will be some little rep repetition, but I'll, I'll talk uh, some, I'll try to have some extra poor things. Uh, 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 I think that he's already said this, uh, why it's important and all that. You know, this, uh, we keep blaming our, this uh, Afghan transit trade and, and we uh, always say Pakistan has a very strategic location and uh, it's on the junction of West Asia, Central Asia, South Asia. But you see, our, uh, we have three exceptional uh, ports. But hardly any trade flowing through uh, our, our country. I mean, uh, it's main reason our tariff. Because if whatever we allow to Afghanistan, we, we all the time, I mean, I, this morning I was reading the paper and they asked the chairman FBI what is one most uh, uh, difficult, uh, what's the worst problem? He said this is uh, tra transit to Afghanistan. And it's not, it's, it's the tariff. You see, there is, if your tariff falls like other countries in the region, they would not take it all the way to Afghanistan and then bring it back because it's a lot of cost. It, they have to, uh, uh, first is transportation, then it takes a long time, then it's, uh, they have to uh, bribe everyone. It's not just customs, there are many, many agencies. So if you just didn't have it, it wouldn't exist, that, that problem. Uh, uh, so let me just see what I have there. Uh, and, and the other reason uh, I was going to go to this, you know, when we have, uh, the whole world is, uh, no matter what uh, Mr. Trump is doing, but, but the world is, has been integrating. You know, they, uh, this is bilateral, regional, 
uh, you know, mega regional, uh, multilateral, but they are bringing down tariffs and other barriers and integrating. Pakistan only tried to do it with China, and then because of its big difference in tariffs there, uh, <laughs> so since then it got scared, and it is not a part of any, uh, the only uh, regional uh, really agreement we, we did was this, uh, first it was called SEPTA, South Asia Preferential, and then it was SEPTA, the, the free trade area in South Asia. Again, if you look, Pakistan kind of has stayed out of that. In, 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 in case of SEPTA, you look at uh, uh, India, Bangladesh bilateral trade, it's 10 billion. If you look at uh, small economy in Sri Lanka, and uh, India, six billion. Pakistan, even in the best of days when it, before it was closed, was two billion. We are a much bigger economy. But even in that SEFTA, because of these tariffs, we, we, because we very high tariffs, so we are scared to, uh, to, to, to bring them down. So we are getting isolated in terms of, uh, you know, this uh, integration. And this is hurting our national security as well. Uh, maybe it's controversial, but I'll say this, uh, you know, this uh, FATF. I mean, maybe there was something wrong, but it's a lot to do with politics. And India has all these uh, uh, regional with, with ASEAN, with, with, with almost all those countries. So they end up with, uh, out of 41 Asian Pacific countries, 37, 38 votes go their side because they have much longer trade. It's a, a trade interest. Pakistan ends up with two or three votes. Uh, again, it's, uh, those are its FTA uh, professional trade agreement uh, partners. So this this tariff is hurting us not only in terms of trade, but in terms of our national security as well. One other thing that happens is that uh, uh, Dr. Nadim is having this uh, seminar here, but and uh, I should have said about this uh, being debated. But this is a very hush hush issue. What they do is. Um, uh, say uh, whenever uh, there, uh, there have been uh, several uh, uh, efforts to reform. I mean, we did this in in the 90s, but every two years, and then there's some across the board regulatory duty. Then something happens. Then something else. And last big effort was from 97 to 2002. But in between, we had that nuclear thing, and we stopped it. But then, uh, 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 Sheriff government came in the first two years radically. They, they did this, uh, and I was fortunate to be involved. I was then member of customs and uh, IMF and everything, and the economic situation was much better. So we could radically cut down tariffs. And, and uh, it was uh, the same minister then. He was the commerce minister, Mr. Zak Daoud, and we were able to do that. And now we are trying desperately to get to where we were in 2002, but we cannot even get there because there's so much resistance. And how they do it, okay, then. That was the last. For 2004, we have not had any reform since then. And, but on the other hand, we reversed. In 2007-08, uh, uh, they, they said, oh, they, they set up an economic advisory council. I don't know if you're a mem that member of that. But they said, there's too many chocolates coming in this country. Yeah. So they, they, they use the name chocolates. And then they asked FBR, why don't you put some, some regulatory duties there? And FBR, for them, everything is luxury. Well, most luxurious thing is computer, mobile phones, anything you take it, and for them, luxury. They start with the chocolate, and the fi finance minister always says, there's too many chocolates, so putting some duties, and then <laughs> there's a long list. It could be 300 items, 500 items, 700 items, and then everything becomes luxury. Uh, in fact, this uh, was renamed in when Mr. Isaac Dar came, he called it dog food or something. There's too much dog food coming in the country. So another round of regulatory duty. In 2018, when this uh, economic advisory committee met, and after we were looking at what they would say out of box, because there's, and they said, there's too much cheese coming in this country. <laughs> cheese is $2 million and some pizza hat to somebody. But they just use one name, and then they go across their uh, SRO, and then because the tariffs are so high, so, uh, and, and then they have to provide something. So, underhand, there is some SROs, 
there is, uh, and, and then there, there was a lot of pressure from IMF and World Bank and other uh, Asian development bank, uh, you know, get rid of it, be transparent. They say, okay, we are getting rid of SROs, there was this big exercise, and they created another, what called, schedule five or six? Yes, five. Five, okay. So all those things shifted in schedule five. So if one person imports, uh, uh, Shabazz is sitting here, steel, he pays one duty, another under SRO, another duty. It's the same thing with chemicals. It's uh, lots and lots of things, which uh, depending on who you are, and uh, maybe it would be agriculture products uh, implements. So uh, they could not say who, so they said, bring a certificate from BOI. If you, if you're a doctor, and uh, dentists say you want to bring your um, dentist chair, then they say, okay, but you have to have this certificate for this and this. So, you know, all these non-transparent policies, and they are very, very much here. Uh, you know, those, uh, whenever there is, uh, there was another, some other uh, on trade policy, and the ex-chairman and, and all that, they said, but we have finished our service. But you have hidden the nuts here, <laughs> you know, you call it uh, Schedule 5. So, uh, uh, and our, uh, uh, then let me finally come to this, uh, I think Rubina is going to go into more details in 2018, uh, what uh, Ashraf had rented. We were, uh, we set up, a, you know, Rubina uh, was the head of that technical team, I was the chairman of that reform committee, and Ashraf was also secretary at pushing, doing all the nasty thing. And we were able to come up with, uh, and Mr. Vasily and some other, <laughs> they used to be regular visitors <laughs> and tell us what to do. So we inter interacted and everything and we, we come up and we said, okay, th there are so many um, raw materials, which if you put, uh, I mean, before 2013, 14, at least raw materials used to be zero. But if you have increased duties so much, so for people, it's much easier to bring the finished product rather than the raw material. So we identified, and another thing we identified was we said, look, I mean, for the same product, if you have 20% duty, and from China, you have a free trade agreement, and it's 3%, and 80-90% is coming from China. Why make your people, just to save duty, go and buy a more expensive product, or maybe not good quality, but let them source from wherever they want to, bring it to the same level as China, and we brought down at least 1,600, we recommended that uh, they should be. And fortunately, that was agreed. But there was another thing. The FBR said, oh, this, so much loss to the country. So they immediately found alternate, many, many headings where they again put duties. So uh, maybe I would say reform may have been 35% and 66% it was. It was uh, made worse, and and our 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 uh, say this uh, custom duty tariff, which uh, as Ashraf was saying, now it's uh, it's import tariffs have uh, climbed up to 50 percent total. Now the big problem the government is realizing they want to compress imports, and their 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 revenue is going down. <laughs> so they they are in a big big. Uh, uh, but the good thing is that. Um, Finally, they have resolved something because I come from FBR, and uh, you know it's uh, you, normally you have loyalty, but but there is a conflict of interest because if you if you make the same person cut tariffs and he the, the, whoever the guy sitting, his mind would be, oh, how can I raise? Because I was first I think uh, uh, maybe uh, I was then chief uh, in in '96 etc. And they they asked us to do some reform and bring down tariffs. And my boss would always tell me, okay, we, we, on the top rate, we have to bring it down to 35%, but try to bring it up somewhere so that we cover that 35%. So all the time, FBR, because whoever is the guy, because he is, he, he is judged by the numbers, how much he has been able to collect at the end of the year, and in net terms, you know, so, so you, they will do anything. And they, they don't realize that if, the tar if these taxes go beyond, a certain limit. Say, um, uh, my experience in those days was that if we had anything tariff more than 20%, that came in smuggling. So we used to make sure that smuggling prone items should be lower than that, so that at least we get some duties. And uh, but, but unfortunately, uh, that is no longer the case. And I, I think I, I'll stop here. Uh, maybe. Yes.
talk some, I think I'm really glad uh, that this debate has been over. And we are grateful to Pai uh, that it has given us an opportunity to first present this thing uh, before the informed and well-educated uh, audience. Uh, it would have been uh, very good if there, there is more business community also here. Um, but uh, still, I think it's, it's a good start. And uh, rather than speaking for, 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 for hours, I would prefer to have your views on it. I think Ashraf has presented the, uh, the policy, the basic uh, crux of the policy. Dr. Saab has talked about the historically how we have um, dealt with, with talent uh, sitting in FBR. Dr. Saab was there, I was there. And we know exactly how the tariff, tariff were done in FDR. With this experience, I think, um, we are fortunate enough now that the tariff policy, the policy, I think, I would say that this is the first time in Pakistan that the word tariff policy is rightly understood by the government. And the, this is, I can safely say that this is the first tariff policy of Pakistan. So far, what was happening in FDR um, was, I think, the two major, there were two major concerns about what was happening so far in FDR. One was, and I think business community and the, all the international organizations have time and again um, reminded the government and shown to the government that these are the two basic issues right now in the tariff structure. One was the complexity. Uh, as Dr. Sagar said, like for, for any one good, there are multiple tariffs. Uh, if you are, there, are, there is a concessionary duty, there is an FTA rate, there is, so, so there are multiple rates for just one product. And uh, even, even not that, for if it is a commercial importer, it will be a different rate, if it's a manufacturer, it will be different. So, so complexity was the one major issue which was highlighted um, by each and everyone be it international organization or be businesses or anyone. And I think another major issue um, in, in the tariff which were done by the, by the FBR um, was the consistency and certainty. And we were just talking to um, some businessmen and they said that why, we, why, the, why there is business is not picking up and why uh, there is no business activity. And I think still the one reason is that there is no certainty. You don't know so if the business is not sure what in the next few years the tariff would be, how can they start a new business or they just keep on with their, with their existing business? So I think these were the two main issues which we tried to address in this tariff policy. Uh, to simplify and uh, so, so, so um, the five major, major things which Ashraf has highlighted are the pillars of that tariff policy. Now, given this, um, it was um, unanimously decided in the government and in consultation with the, with the, with the donors also um, that there should be one secretariat. And so we have finally come up that NPC or the National Tariff Commission would be the secretariat where all the technical work will be done. And of course, then there is a there, there is an institutional structure that whatever is done by the by the by the secretariat would go to the board. The board is, as you have seen, a wide set, widespread representation. It will be discussed uh, thoroughly in the board, and then it would go um, finally for approval of the cabinet or parliament, whatever the case may be. Now. So let me just briefly um, explain here um, why a National Tariff Commission is being selected for this and how National Tariff Commission is um, taking up uh, this responsibility. What are our plans to further strengthen our organization to deal with, deal with this work? I think the one plus point that National Tariff Commission has, I think Dr. you would be uh, aware of that, the National Tariff Commission was created in 1990. And until 1995, 
it was the National Tariff Commission where all the tariff work was done. It was not FBI. And National Tariff Commission used to analyze and give recommendations which were finally done in, done in the budget. In 1995, when under the WTO we signed that agreement of trade remedies, that was where the, that work came to NTC. And after that, NTC uh, put more effort on, on doing that work rather than the tariffs. So it's gradually the tariff work shifted to FBI. So NTC still has that capacity uh, to deal with tariff. Um, we have a technical uh, technical people who know very well about tariff. They are experts in tariff. And other than that, the, in the National Tariff Commission, we have built this word, this function, um, in our law. So National Tariff Commission Act very clearly uh, states what the functions of NTC are, and one of the functions is that. So it's, it's rather than ad hoc and inconsistent, now the tariff comes to an institution which is expert in it, which is designed, which is made up for this purpose, and which is equipped to do this, this work. I'm not saying that whatever was done in FBR um, was not done by professionals or technical people, but I think since it was not their objective, so there was there was a problem of objective, and as Ashraf has said and Rockstar has emphasized, FBR is a is a text collecting agency, and uh, so so their major objective in terms of setting taxes or tariff was to get revenue. So, so that was not the objective, whereas the objective right now, and what we have emphasized in the tariff policy, is industrialization. So, so that's, I think there is a major shift in the objective. And NTC is well equipped, as I said, to, to handle this. And um, we are also planning, we have a long-term plan to strengthen the um, uh, capability of the staff, infrastructure, so we were just discussing with the uh, doctor in the morning. Uh, we would like uh, academic institutes like SPIDE um, to collaborate with us. Like for instance, we, we are looking for developing um, forecasting models, and I think we have um, requested this to bank, and bank, uh, the World Bank is, is, is a, giving us a big financial and technical support in it. And we, we've been trying to develop um, uh, general equilibrium models. We, we are trying to develop the forecasting models. Because tariff, setting up tariff is not just, it's just a part of the tariff policy. Uh, tariff policy needs to see how your exports are going, how your imports are going, how to promote that, what the trend is. So we are trying to develop forecasting models for, for import and export also. And I think as we go along, there will be many more things coming up and as the views from academia and the uh, business community come, um, we would be doing many other things and we would uh, definitely be asking academic institutes for, for collaboration. Uh, Rosa just mentioned how, how we did in the last, and I think what our, broadly our procedure would be uh, right now from onward. Uh, in the last one year, uh, one and a half year, um, NTC did um, work for three budgets. There were two mini budgets, and then the, um, uh, the budget that we last year had. So um, our general practice is to conserve the business community as much as possible. So we had, I think, mean, a um, number of rounds with the business community. And then the Ministry of Commerce on their website and NTC on their website, they open up, they, 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 they seek proposals. Uh, and when these proposals come, we, we, uh, we analyze them. And then we go back to business community and show them that this, this is what our analysis says. And then finally we come up with some recommendations and some changes in the diet. So this is our uh, general practice. And I think in future we will do the same. Um, so now that we know exactly that we have to do it, so other rather than starting this consultation process late in March or April, we have already started. 
So we had started consulting the business community. We will consult academia, we will, um, uh, and all other stakeholders, and we will then. Now, right now, um, I think the business has a big concern uh, regarding the gradual reduction in, and as, as Ashraf has said, since our industry is now used to higher protection levels, and when we are saying that we will gradually reduce tariff, this is a big concern for them. And uh, so I think, let me just briefly explain what um, what we have in mind, and of course we will discuss it with, with, the, with the business community and then finalize it. We started, like in the last budget, we reduced duty from three to zero on 1,600 tariff lines, which were all raw materials in it. Um, we have developed a full, there are about um, 7,000 something tariff lines, uh, and we have developed uh, how we want to reduce tariff on all those tariff lines. So, so that would be our benchmark, and we would consult the business community and see how we accommodate their concerns and as well as the principles of the policy into it. And hopefully, um, what we would like is that we announce upfront our tariff reduction structure um, within, uh, I think maybe at the time of the budget or before that. Uh, so, so this is so far our planet. But one thing is very clear, that tariffs within the next five years tariffs will gradually reduce. The speed would be determined in consultation with all the stakeholders, but this is certain that it will reduce. It will be simplified, it will be reduced. So thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral thank you. Uh, I'm personally very confused to hear I think it's a long overdue, long awaited. And I must confess, maybe my own confession, but I think where we fail, and I, I think I'll ask Dr. Mazur to comment on this, where we fail is that the academic community has failed to establish itself as a stakeholder in the system and as a <coughs> sort of guarantor of free trade, which the academic community should be providing. And some of the Pakistani economists is really not concerned with trade anymore. They should be more concerned with trade niche items. The one thing that you have to do is to put trade front and center in, the, in, in, in our business of uh, the research and advocating the government. Um, there's also another issue that unfortunately uh, the business community also is kind of not close to the uh, to the community. And then, as this, uh, I don't know, just said, well, we, unfortunately, the problem is when we consult with the government, I used to be in the planning commission, when we consult with the government, we always consult with the industries. We don't consult with the, with the services in the largest community. We don't consult with them. They 60% of our government <coughs> services. Um, we don't consult with agriculture, which is, well, it's not a large service, but it's about the same size as the industry. Um, and I think the concentration process should be brought in and the um, academic community should come into the But then I'll make another few issues that are important in the last few years. I'm going to go to the floor. A couple of uh, alarm bells that yeah. my mind <coughs> was protection. And I, have, I think you've done a lot of protection. The second thing I think I see also need, perhaps from you, is the protection policy. We have a protection policy that is not announced and not understood. And I appreciate your pointing to protecting from industries. But you've got 60 year old infants in this country. They don't seem to grow up ever. They, they get protected forever, right? And also part of the protection as well comes from, in fact, not part. Most of the protection comes from non areas. Like for example, now cars are virtually banned from being imported. So that's a huge protection that they've got. And uh, even other, issues, other goods, for example, there are all kinds of protection that are given. For example, take agricultural goods. There's, uh, I think, there's still remain uh, bans on sugar and wheat export and things like that. 
can we do a hit? That's a huge amount of value. We have to clean that up too somehow. Just today, involved in the consultation of the price of wheat. And you know, even the cabinet is cutting up on that. So I think these are very important things to think about. Yes, we all want industrialization. But again, why do we really focus on industrialization when it's a small part of GDP? What about the other sectors? Do we want productivity increase everywhere or do we just want industrialization? I think that's also a thing to issue that I worry about. That we focus too much on industrialization without thinking of productivity increases in general. So I think these are key issues that I'd like to be able to find. Why do we consult on the economic community? What about the economic community? Two, why is the economic community not so popular in the UK? Why are they so focused on kind of studying, for example, food security and all these things? I mean, not that they are important, but trade is also important. Everybody is functioning in the environment, food security, but they're not going to do trade. And the third thing is, why don't we have protection policy? <coughs> And the fourth thing is, why are we giving so many non-tariff values to everybody? And you say you're getting free trade, non-tariff values are a huge problem. And the final thing is, I think my whole life, my whole, and I'm not a young man, my whole life has been spent thinking and talking about test values. When are we finally getting rid of them? Every fund program is very similar to To every fund program, it's written, test values will be eliminated. Then they come back again. There are so still there. So where are we going to get to that? So I'll let each of you answer that. That's just how you want to begin. So thank you. Very apt questions, all of them. Uh, protection policy, I think it's a, an excellent idea for us to work on, Madam. Uh, as, as a sequel to the national tariff policy, if that remains because the, you will have to all the time you will have to deal with the, the, the industry's concerns as well. So there should be a policy somewhere at some level, at least an understanding should be there, even if it is not announced as a, 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 as a production policy, but there should be some guidelines developed that what should be protected, what should not be protected, what should be the time limit, and, and how it uh, protection needs to be grounded. The point is very, very well taken, not so at least at, at my end. <coughs> NTVs, yes. In Ministry of Commerce, we have uh, really a great realization of these two things, which are uh, running counterproductive, and sadly, uh, we had to do it under certain compulsions. I myself was part of some of those uh, NTVs which were announced some of them were even with my signatures. But we did it uh, under certain compulsion and realizing at least in the ministry that this is regressive and completely counterproductive. But there were certain compulsions of policy under which we had to do it when the, the uh, year import bill was shooting out of the roof. Uh, the government was finding it it, we found it really very difficult. Madam and, and myself used to, to negotiate inside of the number of channels uh, that this is not really something a, a progressive step to do, but still under certain compulsions we had to do it. We realize it and slowly they have also to come down. We realize it's, it's uh, a regressive uh, impact on uh, the same as that. Uh, on the agriculture policy, uh, you stole my words, Dr. Saab. We intervene in three uh, crops in this country in the pricing mechanism. One is wheat, the other one is sugar cane, and the third one is tobacco. In all the three of them, we end up having outrageous kind of distortions. <coughs> and at times, we end up producing completely uh, uncompetitive surpluses which we have to sell at a loss of as high a loss as 50% of its, its, its cost. There came a time in wheat when the international market price was $180. We had to give $180 subsidy to get one bag of it exported. Because of this intervention which you very rightly pointed out we need to really pull out at some point in time, I don't know when we are able to do that. In the, in the sugar cane itself, uh, we have four uh, market distorting 
uh, interventions, which I said it in certain forums in, in policy making forums in the country, we need to pull it out. One, we should not be setting the prices of sugarcane. The second intervention which we should pull out is under Sugarcane Act, the factories are compelled to buy all the sugarcane which has been produced. We have to pull out of it, leave it to the market forces if there is a buyer or seller in the market or not. The third one is we have to take off all the things. Even wheat is not a bad item in, in exports. Why sugar is? This is completely incomprehensible. We need to put sugar out of the, the, the banned list of the export policy order. I was the custodian of export policy and I couldn't do it because of many, many things which, which were beyond my pay scale. But I, I, I realized that it, it needs to. The, the fourth thing is, in the intervention is, we have 60% duty on import of uh, raw or any, any kind of sugar. We need to, to pull out of these. This policy for sugar bars that were made when we had the rationing and we had huge uh, deficit of, of production in the country. We are now currently uh, consuming only 5 million uh, tons of, of sugar every year. FAO tells us that we should be producing only 50% of it and 50% we will be better off if we import it and, and redirect our land and water resources to some other thing. And Lo and behold, what kind of, uh, what is the installed capacity in this country? It's 10 million tons. All of them in the, in, in, in the elite of this country's hands. Now, in order to make the, the capacity utilization of the mills which they have established, they keep the, the prices of sugar cane to be artificially higher so that the, the, the producer keeps on producing it and keeps on cannibalizing the other, other, other crops which you need it. We need to act one day. We have to pull it out. We in Ministry of Commerce have liked it, but, but some things we, 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 we need uh, some probably time in the government to, to, uh, to make these things sink in. SROs, we can't agree more, that's uh, the last point on, on, on yours. That SROs in our uh, tariff policy as well, we want to, to uh, we have euphemized it, that this SRO culture needs to, to go down. Two things we have put in there. One is that uh, the difference between different kinds of uh, importers will be eliminated. This is basically through SROs where the difference has been created. So the difference will go down. And the second one is that the concessions and simplification. This is again another euphemism of uh, really reducing the burden of SRO. Madam <laughs> Arsene. Answer on, on, on SRO, uh, I think when we say simplification, we actually mean to get away with, get rid of all these SRO. Uh, and not just SRO, there are different schedules in, in custom style. Uh, we have already started working on some of the schedules and SROs. So, so when we say simplification, it actually means no SROs, no, no, no more schedules. Just one schedule of tariff duties. Uh, yeah, uh, just a couple of points on, on protection. When I should say that it would be time bound, uh, you know, we have tried this. I'm an old man, he's a young man, but in '95, we, uh, they, I think ICI was setting up a polyester product party. We said time bound, only five years. Five years finished, another five years, another five, this 2020, and still that. In the, in the meanwhile, the rest of the world has moved uh, their, their composition, uh, governments and, and their uh, cloth composition has changed from cotton-based to uh, man-made fiber or polyester and all that. Pakistan still stays there because they, uh, they find it difficult to use polyester because it has beauty, it's protected. We protect one industry and ruined another 300 industries there. That, that was one. The other goes on, on this, uh, when we say again, you know, this um, auto industry says, we were one of the first developing countries to start producing cars in 1954. And till today, we have all, uh, you know, this uh, 
in, in 1995 when WTO came into being and they had a certain uh, uh, rule, um, agreement called Trade Related Investment Measures, TRIMS. That means you cannot have these deletion policies and import substitution policies. And they gave five years to countries like Pakistan. When five years ended, uh, I was then uh, I was, uh, here, but uh, anyway, I, I went to Geneva as a master. So the first thing I was tasked, given to me, get us another seven years. <laughs> so <laughs> I was going around asking ambassadors, please, uh, this, this, this. And you know, many of them said, okay, you know, okay, I have two, three years, but seven years and then another ten years. And they said, look, I mean, we, our auto industry never progressed till we had this because we forced our auto makers to use the local, well, whatever it is, uh, some engine part or, or uh, tire or something. In the process, the whole car industry, car quality came down. And while, you know, we kind of uh, maneuvered it and we were not challenged, India was challenged in the WTO by US and EU and they lost the case and their investors said, thanks God we lost it. <laughs> now we tell our industry, we, can, we have to get rid of this import substitution and our cars then at the time were much better. We were these Honda and and and, 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 and Indians really look, used to look forward, uh, look up to us. And then they only used to have that one ambassador car. And now you, 15 years later, you see how their auto industry is gone. And, and through this, it's not only just the titles, but we have these SROs that we don't let any new investment come in. Because how we, that's another clever way. We say when you come, Within two years or three years, you have to make 50% local parts. And those, this Mercedes, they said, they all try to come in. They said, how can we do this? So they, they you know, they're, they're blocked. Last year, uh, two years ago, we opened up a little bit and many showed interest. So we had these things. That, um, one was this, and the, uh, your other question was about, uh, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll come to it later. Ah, yes. Uh, this um, uh, consultations, why we just c consult industry. It's, you know, it's kind of, uh, if it's considered patriotic to be supporting your industry. Okay, I can understand this. But anytime you say something else, they say, oh, you want us to be a trading nation? Yeah. It's, it's so looked down upon this. Now, Dubai, for example, is a trading nation and has exports of 360 billion. That's six times more. We have 60, there's 300 trade, over trade, and, and non oil trade, 360. So, and, and other trading, but for us, it's a oh, very projective term, you know, you want to become, and you want to ruin this. So, so it's, it's uh, extremely difficult to, uh, you know, for example, um, uh, let's say, um, Turkish example, an agriculture product. They say, let, let uh, agriculture product come in. What they do is process them, add value, and export them. They import 7 billion worth of uh, agriculture products, export 14 billion, make another 7 billion. So there are many, many examples. But uh, of all the countries, uh, if you look at our exports, and um, you know, we have an exceptionally good little um, uh, booklet that we published last year that sums up, it's not very complicated, it's very small, you must read it. And, and, and they gave uh, uh, about uh, all, all these things in, in that, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, this little booklet that you published last year. It's not published yet. This is about tariffs, etc. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, but maybe, I don't know whether it's published or whether it's just uh, privately circulated. We can put it on Twitter. Huh? We can put it on Twitter. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that, that's really that. Uh, uh, so, uh, sorry I lost my train, but I'll stop here and there. Uh, and, and, and last point about sugar, often we end up uh, exporting it to India under subsidy. So we are all the time, on the other, one hand, we don't want to trade with India. Then we subsidize their consumer <laughs> to buy Pakistani cheap, uh, much uh, sugar cheap, cheaper. Okay. Doctor, thank you very much. Sometimes it's good not to do your job very well, so I wish you failed in W here to get a seven-year extension. No. <laughs> <laughs> then we may have better cars today and less protection. But anyway, with that, let me throw the floor open. Anybody? Go ahead, uh, uh, 
So I have two comments to start with, and I'll start with the last one. Uh, I have basically plotted some graphs of trade as a percentage of GDP. You are very right that the focus of Pakistan has never been to think about us as a trading uh, country. So we are at the bottom in terms of our regional partners uh, such as Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. <coughs> and this is what is missing from the national tariff policy as well, that we don't find focus on trade overall. Rather, it is more towards export. So this is one focus which I think is totally missing from this national tariff policy. Second thing which I would like to point out, and Dr. Mazur have already mentioned it, that our uh, total trade tax is not 48% of the total revenues. It's about 19%, uh, uh, rather 17% of this year. It was about 15% uh, in 2016. So I think you need to correct it because that gives a... Okay. You just look at the FBR yearbook yeah. and you look at, uh, you see, maybe you're just talking about custom duty. Custom duty maybe 18%, 9%. And then, then there is, uh, on top of it, all these are, uh, they come from import taxes. Okay. There is additional sales tax, there is, with the in, in income tax is imported on, 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 on imports. So all so those, tax. yes, yes all of those combined make 48, what, what do you spend? Okay. So this is one confusion. The second thing which you talk about the uh, tariff lines, which I plotted from the World Bank data that our tariff rate on average basis on primary products is not that high. If you look at across uh, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, India, we are almost the same. So I was just wondering that the comment which you are making about having a very high tariff, is it based on certain HS codes of our exports basically, where you feel that the difference in terms of uh, uh, tariff rates is too much as compared to our compatriots? The last point which I would like to raise is particularly about uh, the policy objectives where we talk about that we are going to have reduction in our uh, uh, tariffs on the raw material. If you look at the effective protection studies, uh, that has been biased towards the manufacturing sector. These are not the ones in which we have the comparative advantage. So instead of only providing the effective protection, we should think about having more comparative advantages. And that is not just the tariff which is required in the export sector. That's the total factor productivity, that is energy bottlenecks, and so many other things. And this is one of the comments as well, because your report starts off with a particular incident of about 2016 in which the tariffs were increased, so therefore the exports are used. There are many other factors which were hampering the exports at that time. It's not just the tariff line. And finally, uh, when we talk about the infant industry, as rightly pointed out, that what do we mean by infant industry? Is it the innovation? Is it the employment? Is it the legacy? Or is it the comparative advantage? What exactly is the infant industry which we are carrying through? And lastly, in all the policy document, I fail to understand that why aren't we taking into account the import policy order 2016, the Customs Act, the Strategic Trade Policy Framework 1922, which is going to be developed, why are we not thinking that the tariff policy cannot be in uh, like separate item towards other things? And finally, uh, just a uh, request that not all things should go to the PM for approval. You should have a mechanism of thinking about what needs to go. For example, if you are processing the anti-dumping duties, these are also tariff lines basically which you are talking about. These doesn't go to the uh, PMs. So when you have certain policies, it should have some dedicated parts. Thank you. Uh, I first wanted to congratulate uh, Commerce and the National Time Commission. I think this is, this is great. It's great on three fronts. It's great because it builds institutionality around type setting. Uh, that National Tariff Board, I think, is a, is, a, is a great thing to bring in the different players to bring in a, a public-private client of platform also. Uh, I think it's great because, as it was mentioned, the first National Tariff Policy, this is going to reduce uncertainty for businesses. This is a very good thing. 
third thing of why I think this is great is that it's a path for the reduction of the anti export bias. Now, a question that I wanted to pose to, to the panel is, uh, it has been mentioned a couple of times the cascading uh, and the infant industry protection. So in infant industry, I have comments related to what was mentioned by the, the previous uh, commentator, that is, can we define that? Because as uh, Dr. Mansour was saying, uh, the car industry, you know, it was born in, 19, in the 1950s in Pakistan. So if, if they are infant, I'm also an infant. <laughs> uh, so that, how do we define that? And do we want to define that at the industry level or do we want to define that at the firm level? Because the ones that are infants or not are the ones that are new or not are firms, but not sectors, right? So perhaps <coughs> this deserves some attention. And then on cascading, I would invite uh, some debate. So why, why do we want cascading? Uh, because cascading means basically anti-export bias. So cascading means protecting those that produce final goods and that results in these firms wanting to sell to the domestic market rather than to sell abroad. So I understand the political economy of it and I understand it would require a gradual process to you know to think about reductions in final in tariffs on final goods. Uh, but I, I would like to know how the panel feels about this uh, thinking longer. I'm Usman Zia from Fight. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate for uh, congratulate you all because we have <coughs> got this first ever national health policy, and the policy is uh, uh, addressing many uh, good things. That, um, uh, uh, we, get, we are going to, for the first time we are going to use uh, uh, the tariff instrument as a trade in, a, in a, uh, not as revenue generation but as a trade instrument. So <coughs> whenever we impose a tariff, it means that um, the industries, we are protecting our industries, local industry, but the consumer welfare is at stake. So <coughs> now uh, by introducing this policy, it means we are moving towards, uh, 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 towards <coughs> reducing uh, the, the consumer fear, and then uh, consumer welfare will uh, be the objective of this policy. But if we go through the uh, tariff structure, we still see there are so many SROs which are uh, uh, under amendments. So I am still afraid that uh, will there be consumer welfare because what you are going to do with those SROs, are they, um, they are going to be implemented again? And uh, secondly, I think that uh, this policy lacks some commitment and there some timelines lines are not defined in the policy and uh, we, uh, ongoing uh, to the gradual structure, I think we should move towards um, doing uh, 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 sudden commitments, but well, not uh, sudden, uh, uh, sh they should be quick commitments because this government has five years to play. And uh, if we are taking five years to uh, apply all the uh, stuff, stuff, what we are going to, what eventually we will be doing. Thank Assalamu alaikum, I'm Dilawar Khan, uh, economic student, research, special women. Actually, I'm working on uh, devaluation and its impact on trade balance, as it has been uh, stated that it is going to break the de uh, trade deficit that Pakistan mm -hmm. is historically facing. But when we talk about the theories, for example, Marshall Learner, Jacob, and all that, they say that when devaluation takes place, it is going to, of course, improve the trade balance. How? Because it will make the imports expensive. But to, in order to make the imports expensive, there are two channels. First is uh, these tariff policies. Secondly, we can say that we uh, let the exchange rate open or floating. But in the meanwhile, the state said that we are going to allow the exchange rate to float because uh, imports are very inexpensive and cheap for Pakistan. But it, it means that when the exchange rate depreciated, imports got expensive. But on the other hand, the tariff policy, when it is going to reduce the tariff rates, it's again going to make the imports cheaper. How these antagonistic policies are going to make effect for Pakistan uh, trade? My name is Abbas Akbarani. 
I represent the Middle East as well as the States. I am very happy to attend this session. And I think this is a step in the right direction. And what we need to do is, and this is just my suggestion, is to do sectoral analysis of each sector. <coughs> this is missing at the FDR level, this is missing at the level. But at least in this research institute, we can develop certain sectoral analysis of various sectors. <coughs> And if we have a, if industry has a certainty and also at the same time time bound measures, at least we don't need to come to Islamabad so often. We would love to come to Islamabad to have a cup of tea with all the people, but too much time is wasted in coming and representing little little irritants that disturbs the industry. I think all of our policies should be towards global international practices, which every sector of the industry should be developed. And I think the time-bound decision-making has to be done at all levels. Because until and unless that is not done, it is not going to improve the situation. As far as quality is concerned, I would strongly suggest that second-hand equipment should not be allowed to be imported into the country. This results in substandard production of components. Also, intermediate goods which are substandards, which do not meet the international standards, should not be allowed. And the deletion programs, as you said, is very true. We are now in the age of electric vehicles. We have to make a good policy to make sure that we benefit and also reduce the emissions. And I am very happy that you have come here today. I have learned quite a lot. And please do include me in further discussions as we would like to put in our two and a bit of this situation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Burdi. Let me now <coughs> good question. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, many questions have been raised, so let me just whatever I remember I try to uh, reply to that and then talk some I think um, first you raised some questions. There was some technical I think misunderstanding how we have calculated, so that was clear. You said the focus. I think the focus in this whole policy, uh, the main the main thing is that if you want to increase your exports, the imported raw materials used in those export products should be at lower cost. So that basically is the idea. If we reduce tariff on the imports which are used in export products, that would give some incentive um, to increase our. So, so that was the main idea. Main idea. Uh, you are right in saying that we should focus more on, on, on the comparative advantage and of course this is another uh, factor, will be the main factor in, in the policy. So we, we are very well um, aware of that and we have tried to capture, capture this. It's, uh, it's. So uh, you also said the why, why only tariff and why not other, other. So I think one thing, and I think some of the other questions which probably you raised also, tariff policy is not an isolated policy. You see, it's it has to interact with all the other policies. So you can't just uh, go for one policy independent of other policy. So you said, why not quick result? What you mean is that why not a rapid reduction? Okay. So. Uh, it's not possible because you certainly, as, as we have just seen, that if 50% of your data, of your revenue, is coming from these import taxes, um, uh, you cannot ignore that. You cannot ignore that and you can't substantially reduce your revenue in one, one year 
when you don't have any other alternatives. I think this is Ministry of Commerce and like in the business community and also the international world have all the time been raising this issue that revenues should be generated through domestic taxes, which is sales tax and income tax, rather than the import taxes. So I think this, this debate is there and this understanding is there and we need all our policies, our, let's say our revenue policy, our industrial policy to coordinate with, with these other policies um, uh, to have such kind of, such kind of effects. So um, this is probably, um, and as you said that why it has to go to the PM uh, and it shouldn't be, there should be delegation. Now, that is very well defined within, um, the, within the government uh, and within the respective laws of the different organizations or offices. Now, it's, it's within the law that uh, any change in tariff, in customs duty, should go to the parliament. That should be decided by the parliament. So that's why you have seen that any changes in tariff are done at the time of the budget when it is prevent, presented before the parliament. Now, anti-dumping, anti-dumping through a law, National Tariff Commission is authorized to impose anti-dumping duty. So it it does not require to go to any other authority, either to prime minister or to parliament. When NTC, after a thorough investigation, finds out and decides that there should be anti-dumping duty or countervailing was, um, they can impose that. So, so that is well defined within the government structure, which thing should go to the ECC, which to the Prime Minister, which to the Parliament. So I think yeah, that's why we, we stay within, within, within those that, uh, parameters and limitations. Um, I think another uh, interesting uh, question that's raised by representative from World Bank and we have often discussed that in, in person also and that is the why cascading because we all understand uh, theoretically, practically cascading is the basic um, anti-bias uh, element. I think uh, my answer um, in my personal capacity I would definitely say that yes you are right um, but as I said uh, the government has all other other compulsions, and in addition to that, it's it's on the business community part to also understand. Uh, and so far, we have not been very successful in um, in in making the business community understand um, that this is not even in their favor, and this is not in favor of the economy also. So I think probably we'll take more more time for that, and we would like such institutes and academia um, uh, to support us in this and highlight this that this is something uh, we need to consider very really seriously, and our business community should understand um, that what its implications are, because when we talk to uh, to the business community, each industry look at its own industry or its own firm. Uh, so no, they don't look at collectively. So unless and until the businesses also look collectively into it, um, these, the major, um, major, I think, elements <coughs> in the policy uh, cannot be brought in. Um, you raised the question of consumer welfare also. I fully agree with you that this is one of the, one of the ultimate objective of any government policy should be. And um, so I think there is this understanding, but as I said, complexity of policies <coughs> sometimes give, gives you, you know, like diverging or contradictory uh, results. And as a result, right now what we are seeing is um, there is no consideration about the consumer. The way the, the prices are rising, the, the inflation right now we are seeing and what, in a mess what we are in right now, so there is no consideration for consumer welfare and prices. Um, so uh, I think I just tried to um, probably what I remember the questions and answers is and I just let Doc up to answer whatever he thinks. Um, uh, three or four things. One, tariffs not being too high. 
I mean, okay, this is the general perception huh, in Pakistan, and especially our academic institutions and, and, and ministries and policy makers, they always think like that. But maybe you don't trust us and look at any any international, whether this WTO, when we go for our uh, six year trade review and they say your tariffs are very high. And, and they give they give data. You see the World Bank, everything. You know, they they, they, they give comparison. And and uh, another thing, in 2013-14, for a little while I was working with this on a USA trade project, and we looked at all the sectors, and we took uh, five countries in the region: Sri Lanka, India, and this that. And in every single case, not one sector we are lower than other. So so that is more or less established. And sometimes it's very deceptive. You look at tariff, they say it's 20%. Then there's additional duty, another 2%. Another duty, another So, they, you know, it's it's really, really, I can assure you, it's, it's uh, and I should show a slide here, you know. And the fact that we get 20% of our, uh, uh, and in the rest of the world, custom duty maybe contributes 2%, 3%, maybe in some rare cases, 5%, and here it's 20%. So, so that. Um, I'm cascading. I I have a slightly different view from my colleagues. I think uh, in FBR once or twice they actually tried to make it cascaded tariff, and it was so complex. And then there were so many anomalies, so they had to redo the whole budget because there were 300. Because what happens? Okay, you take uh, say you take um, uh, steel, and you say whatever we make from steel steel will be the lowest and then you have machinery the highest and once you make machinery the highest, <laughs> it's gone. You take uh, paper and then you say, oh, what, what do we make from paper? And the paper, we, we print books and you cannot have 20% on books, uh, you know, for various reasons, but also uh, there's an international, uh, this thing that you have to have zero duty. So, and, and this applies to many, many things. Once you, you, you start, actually start doing it, it, it doesn't work. This is this cascading, and another thing is, you know, when, when you take say uh, some uh, raw materials, say wheat, and you convert it into uh, uh, conflicts, uh, 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 other you know, uh, whatever it is, that was uh, serious. So even if you have the same ten percent, the cost of uh, corn is much lower. So 10% is not quite the same 10% on the finished product. Maybe that is $10, so it comes $1, and $100, it comes $10. So it's the, the whole concept, it doesn't work, and it's not the right way, but it's a politically correct way, because if you didn't say it, <laughs> the whole thing will fall. Um, sorry, there are two other points. Uh, I'm cascading this. Uh, uh, well, it's, uh, sectoral, uh, Mr. Vasi said. We, uh, yes, you're right, there's normally this is missing. And I think it, it, the, I work both FBR and, and now Mr. Kamas and DC. And this is the more thought work they do because they are familiar where they had to put this uh, anti-dumping and anti-subsidies and all those duties. So they immediately look at that, that, you know, this industry was already having this problem. If you do this, uh, uh, the problem. But in that study that we did in 2013-14, we prepared a three-year tariff. And that tariff was according to each sector. Steel sector, chemical sector, this sector, that sector. You know, I mean, sometimes what happens is that we, if we try to please one sector, then the other sector, we, uh, we have this problem that in, in the last one, because the engineering sector said, look, I mean, if you start with steel at 52%, they would show us the duty, uh, uh, bill of entry. How can we make any engineering goods? It was the same with, ke with chemical people. Uh, textile would say, bring down uh, everything on, 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 on all the chemicals. And then the chemical ke keep running to us. How can you do this? <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not that uh, simple. I think I'll stop here, maybe. Uh, I don't know if I, I should sure cover something. Very quick, as most of the, the issues have been covered, I stop uh, myself from repeating those. Just a small comment on, on the first comment writers questions on data. Uh, probably we were looking at the different sets of data, but we use the same World Bank database and all the figures which we have done, we counter chapter many times, so maybe you are looking at different type of data than, than, than we were looking at. Uh, the why tariff policy only and not many other things, 
the answer, short answer is tariff policy is an integral part of our next STPF. It is embedded into it. This is one chapter in the STPF. So it will address some of your, your concerns that why we have not addressed the total fact productivity or, or, or many other aspects. Because it's the tariff policy, it uh, is limited to the tariff component, but all the other things are being covered in the, the, the tariff, in the SPPF. On the, the infancy side, uh, Gonzalo's question that, uh, and, and the, the ever infancy with the Dapsal also mentioned, yes, we, uh, it's very difficult to define infancy, but in, in nearly everything you cannot put, uh, in any policy everything cannot be put in black and white on the, on the day one. You have to take the decisions as they, they come up to you. In fancy for one sector will be different, the period will be different from the other sector or, or another industry. So uh, yes, while we have to, to address this issue of uh, people using the infancy argument for perennially remaining in the infancy, but at some point of time, let me just give you one small example. We are now currently working on developing the, the mobile uh, assembly in, in Pakistan. You have to give them some breathing space for X number of years to develop it, to, to, to make them some protection at some point, uh, at the initial stage for X number of years. You need them, uh, every country probably you are an economist, I am not. Uh, nearly every country in the world has used uh, the protection for limited period of time for as an instrument of industrialization. Uh, it will be very difficult to do it without it. Let me just throw a question to Dr. Saab Pide and, and the economists in the room. Can you conduct a research on how many of the industries in this country, country have used the economies of scale argument for developing competitiveness for the global market. Can you identify on top of your head even one as we speak today? The industries which we have developed for the export competitiveness or the global competitiveness are completely different from the ones which are serving the, the, the domestic market. It means the argument which you come you listen from your, your, your stakeholders all the time is that we need breathing space and the infancy period now contradicting my own argument earlier that the infancy stage we need to have this for the, the to generate economies of scale goes out of the window there is not one industry in this country if I'm, I'm, I'm allowed to be sweeping in my statements which has used this country's market for developing the economies of scale to become competitive at the global level. The, the answer is, is really, uh, I, I would really invite somebody to, to the sub conduct the research on it. The last small comment is uh, the sectoral analysis in the, the tariff analysis structure. We are working on the, the, the two-side approach. The horizontal level, bringing all the tariffs down across the board, but when we are doing it, we will be looking at the sectoral analysis vertically as well. Madam is working very uh, carefully on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shusab. But now I'm really worried. Because I don't think we should manufacture or assemble mobile phones. I think we're setting ourselves again for a fall. Uh, it's like the car assembly thing. We'll be manufacturing yesterday <coughs> mobile phones. The mobile phone industry is much faster than the car industry. It just does not stand still. It changes all the time. How will we change as research comes into the rest of the world? We are not doing any research in the subject. I think that's a major subject we also have to think about. Industry is no longer what it used to be. It's not machineries and plants and things. It's really R&D. And when we fail, we have absolutely no R&D, despite the fact that the government collects a number of cesses and there's no R&D whatsoever. Okay. So I think quite frankly, uh, we've got a huge problem here in terms of interpreting infant industry, in terms of interpreting protection, in terms of getting rid of the SROs, and in terms of getting rid of the not letter barriers, and so many other things that we need, the licensing requirements, etc., etc. So 
So the issue is, it's a, I think we've got to make a tremendous start, very good start. At least we've got a tariff uh, policy, but we need to go much further now. And I urge all my colleagues here, make tariff policy central to the work or trade policy. And we should really begin to uncover trade policy to help the Ministry of Finance and others, your comments and others, to see how we can make this country free and open. Now I'll say, G. G. Uh, you know, the rest of the world has moved on from producing these finished things, finished industry, finished car, finished mobile phone. That, that's now global value chains. And more than 50%, 60%. They, you know, because in countries like, uh, say, Philippines, realize we cannot compete uh, uh, against China. So what do we do? We try to fix in our parts. They started exporting our components, 30 billion of components. In Pakistan, we are still fixated. We should have a fully local made car. That doesn't happen. So it's much easier now because you just have to, you know, for example, these auto parts. Pakistan exports about 20 million. Look at even, you know, some of these um, uh, countries which are not that good in engineering, any of these uh, the tunnels or anything, uh, it would be at least 400 million, 500 million. But we have just fixated on finished things and that's gone, the, the, the time is gone. Very good. You wanted to make quick comments? Yes, because we're now coming to the post. You were talking about SROs. SROs have always fascinated me. It's, I think, something that we've created as a country that probably nobody else has. Uh, you spoke about the fact that, and we know this, that this is a part of, it, it lies within the Constitution, that any tax that is imposed has to go through the vote of the parliament, has to get the vote of the parliament. SROs, from what I understand, don't go through this, uh, through this process. Is that, is that correct? Yep. I think, uh, um, SROs are of many types. Um, if there is a small, you know, like a change in the in the in the document, or so that would be one one SRO. So so we are collecting that. So that's that's. But I'm only referring to the ones uh, that no. tweak the tariff structure. That's no, the I think this is this is well established. There is no ambiguity. In it. Um, tariff customs duty cannot be changed by FDR to SRO. But we do have SROs that are doing that. So they yeah. go through the... Uh, no, no, no. So SROs, those are the SROs which come after the budget. So where the tariff duty is changed. So, so it comes, it's, it's, it's uh, down to SRO, but that has been already approved by the father. But Does this come under the change? Maybe uh, yeah, we have a custom officer here. Yeah, yeah, but can they can also through the ECC. Yeah, yeah. It, can be, yeah. it can be through the ECC. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. some yeah. changes yeah. are made through ECC. Yeah, he wants to clarify. He's the most recent retiree. And he has worked in customs budget in that area. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, custom, no doubt, custom tariff uh, is complicated one. Uh, but there are certain things which are now out of the powers of the FDR. Now, if they want to change any duty through SRO, no, it's not so simple as it used to be uh, two, three, four years ago. So that's one part. Another area which I, uh, I want to make a small suggestion for this August forum. That is, uh, we are concerned with the high tariff that these are also improving our exports. There are four export-oriented schemes in this country where imports of all sorts, even prohibited goods can be imported for manufacture of export goods. That is number one is DTRE, another is manufacturing bond, another is temporary importation under SRO 492, another is the export-oriented export units. There, there are four schemes, any type of imports can be imported at zero duty and tax. The problem is those four schemes are need to be seen holistically. Where are the problems? Why those schemes are not being used effectively? Why we, we are looking for the, the, the tariffs? But tariff is there. But the point is that export the, either the, the TDP, or uh, any other sector, they have to see and address the bottlenecks in those four schemes. Rather, there is need of force, why not one scheme? 
and make one the simplest one, concern the stakeholders, concern the manufacturer, concern the exporters. Why? What are the problems for them? Why they are not using it? If we develop this sector simultaneously and on the other hand we we'll reduce the tariffs to the tariff policy, I think we will be, we'll be able to make great impact on pushing our exports. When I, I don't even when I say that even the prohibited items under the trade policy can be imported in DTI. Excellent. Very good point, Chief. I think there's lots of issues that still need to be discussed. It's a huge issue. And as I said, we need to keep it under the radar and keep discussing it. So with that, let me invite you to coffee and tea outside in front of the and then the mail hall downstairs. And there we can continue the conversation. You can talk to the speakers and get more information. Thank you.